Good evening and welcome to the February 12th Council work session. This is Lincoln's birthday officially, so a little moment of happy birthday, Abe Lincoln. And uh, our first item of business actually is um, committee reports, items of interest. Are there councillors who have committee reports or items of interest to, that you would like to share today? I have one. Two. Betty, take it away. Oh, okay. Um, El Rapa Board voted to ban outdoor burning in the, in the urban growth boundary starting April 1st. And we have a vacancy on the El Rapa Board in May, if someone, anyone's interested. And the other thing <clears throat> I wanted to t say over and over again is people are going crazy with the turkeys. Oh. <laughs> and some of you may have seen the letter to the editor that wished they would all go to Betty Taylor's yard. <laughs> and, and after that, I looked out the front, I looked out my front window and there were about 40 turkeys. <laughs> oh my. So you know apparently they, they are. <laughs> Words out. Turkeys can read. Them. They can read the paper. <laughs> they knew where to come. But I do think I do think we need to do something up to help people with the turkey and rat problems. And cats. Yeah. Cats. Well, I won't dare say that. <laughs> the city manager has cats. <laughs> Any? Uh, Greg, go for it. <clears throat> and uh, my cat is watching both of them. By the way. Um, so uh, I attended my first uh, meeting of the LTD strategic planning um, committee and uh, most of the conversation was focused on uh, Springfield and uh, Main Street and you know what they're going to do in terms of safety issues and other things um, and how you know the future of uh, transit fa factored into that particular, uh, effort, um, you know, they've been dealing with this for quite some time now, and uh, I'm not sure if they're, I don't think that they're really focused on MX as being the uh, panacea for uh, the issues that they have to deal with over there, and they're looking at different forms of high-capacity high transit um, and other uh, structural improvements to uh, Main Street to, you know, cut down on, um, well, actually to, to increase safety and to cut down on some of the um, traffic incidents that they've had over the, the last few years. Thank you. Anybody else with a comment? Okay, I think we are ready then to roll into our first item of business, Edison Elementary School parking. Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll uh, turn it over to Alyssa to take us through this conversation. Good evening. My name is Alyssa Hansen, and I'm with the City's Planning Division and here to talk about uh, parking at Edison. So Edison Elementary School, like most of you know, is located in South Eugene, just south of the um, University of Oregon, nestled into the South University Neighborhood Association. It is one of the oldest and smallest school sites in the 4J School District. It's also been identified, probably for these reasons, um, for possible reconstruction or remodel as part of a potential upcoming bond measure that um, 4J is considering um, for putting on the November 2018 ballot. As you've heard, Edison has no on-site parking, meaning they do not have a parking lot. Their site is is strictly full of you know either the school or outdoor uses. Um, there are, however, 35 parking spaces um, on the street that surround the school. And currently, um, that is a two-hour parking zone. But the city and 4J have a or city and Edison have an agreement that allows school employees to park there. Um, they get a permit and they're able to park there for the school day. Um, and that's up, that's usually renewed. I think it's renewed on an, an annual basis. So as a part of the upcoming bond measure proposal, um, 4J, as I said, is considering rebuilding and remodeling the school to accommodate up to 450 students. 
based on uh, that size, our land use code would require 42 parking spaces. And just, this is a very rough number, but that would take roughly half an acre in size, so half a football field, if that helps you for context. Um, given the size of the site, which is roughly two and a half acres, that w there's been concern raised that requiring our on-site parking would take up space that's currently being used by the play areas, the fields, and the other outdoor activities. And then 4J has also been looking into what it would cost to provide structured parking, and that would add somewhere in the range of three to five million dollars um, to the bond measure. Um, so in terms of how we handle parking um, in the city, typically people Typically, it's handled during the permitting process, either through a land use application or through a building permit. And in this case, 4J, if they were coming in for a, a building permit today, would have two options. The first would be a variance, and both of these options are land use applications that are approved or reviewed, I should say. Um, they're a planning director approval, and then they're appealable, um, it, but they don't they don't raise to the level of of city council approval. Um, so the variance would allow them to request a waiver to on site parking, and that's something that we would look at based on the criteria or the regulations in the land use code. And they would have to you know explain what their special circumstances are, you know, what what it is that triggers the need for them to waive their parking requirements. Another option would be what's called an adjustment review, which our code would allow, the land use code would allow them to reduce their parking by 50%, so get it down to 21 parking spaces, and then hopefully they could come up with a shared parking agreement with somebody within a quarter of a mile to provide those parking spaces. Now there's not a lot of options because it's a fairly residential neighborhood. Um, there may be a church in the vicinity that would have parking spaces that they could share. So that would be one another method that they could meet all of their parking needs without impacting the school site. Or as I mentioned, both of these are discretionary land use applications. They're subject to public notice and appeal. And in either case, 4J wouldn't have the certainty before the, of the outcome of this process until closer to construction. Um, and that's because these applications are only effective for 18 months. So if they came in today and asked for a variance, and they got approved, that would only be good for 18 months. So if they were coming in to build their school in the next 18 months, that would work out. But sometimes with these bond measures, things do take longer. And they wouldn't have the certainty necessarily, if they were going to wait until they were building, they wouldn't have the certainty for the November bond measure um, that whether or not they were going to receive this land use application approval. So they would need to include the parking in their plans at that time. So you've received a support, I think you've heard support from neighborhood residents to waive the on-site parking requirements and to allow the use of this, this street parking. And there is an organized group that has been conducting outreach with neighbors and parents and teachers and uh, neighborhood residents. And based on their outreach, they have found strong support for the waiving of, of parking requirements here and the use of the street parking. In addition, the South University neighborhood and the Edison Parent Council have passed resolutions supporting the same. And 4J recently submitted you a letter that echoes those same sentiments about uh, waiving the parking requirements. Now, you may be the city council, but you can't just waive those like that. So you, you're not going to walk out of here today if that's what you wanted to do. You're not going to walk out today having waived those requirements. It does require a legislative process. So you could initiate land use code changes to make such changes, but it will require um, notice to the state, mailed public notice in a legal ad, and public hearing with city with um, planning commission. Planning commission makes a recommendation, and then it comes to a hearing, city council, and then finally city council action. And that kind of process can take for this type of code amendment would take you know around five to six months. Um, and just as I mentioned in the agenda item summary, this kind of land use code change isn't unprecedented. Um, you've, the council has approved code amendments that reduce parkings, for instance, for Autzen Stadium. Also, uh, 
approved code amendments that increased parking, say for multifamily apartments in the university neighborhood. So, I mean, there has been changes to the parking. Typically, when there's a reduction in parking, um, they're usually approved in conjunction with what we call a transportation demand management program, or TDM. I know they're both wonky terms, but really what they mean, they're a program that incentivizes, encourages, um, alternative modes of transportation, walking, biking, busing, carpooling. And so um, the most of the folks, or the places that we know that have reductions in their parking have a number of programs in place or infrastructure or educational programs that really encourage people to not rely on just automobile trips. So in this case, we think it would be appropriate that if there is a waiver to the on-site parking requirements here, that it go in conjunction with a transportation demand management program. Um, and I think I am going to leave it at that. There is a suggested motion for you if you are interested in taking that proactive approach to, wait, to initiate a land use code amendment to waive the parking requirements. Otherwise, if uh, if you don't, then, I mean, 4J always has the option to go forward with a variance or an adjustment review, but that's not something that, that the council would be part of. Great. Thank you very much for that explanation. I have Mike and then Alan in the queue. Anybody else? Okay, Mike, take your Thank way. you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liz, for the report and for that information. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> tell me what would happen if, what would be the consequence of us not entering into a demand management agreement with 4J, or actually the way it's written, I suppose it says. Um, requiring 4J. I suppose that's different than creating an agreement. It creating essentially agree well, says, it we'll do yeah, this if and only if you guys create a demand management program. So what would be the consequence of us not saying that? Well, I potential consequences, I mean, I'm not, have a crystal ball, but potential consequences could be as that school grows and there's not the encouragement or the infrastructure for people to white walk or bike or carpool or take the bus more, that there would be more congestion around there. There would be more issues with the parking um, in the neighboring streets where there's two hour parking. I mean, I think those are the biggest things. I can see those consequences of real world consequences. I was speaking more about process and legal restrictions. What would be the re consequence of th us not requiring that of the 4J? I don't believe there would be a legal consequence. Okay. So we're saying we require it even though there's no real consequence I, for us not requiring it? I, yeah, and I don't think we're requiring it because of legal requirements. It's more, it's in alignment with our policies. If you think about the goals of the, the 2035 transportation system plan, and we're trying to triple our percentage of trips made on foot, bicycle, and transmit, transit, um, you know, just, and also with Envision Eugene about protecting, repairing, and enhancing neighborhood livability, it really goes in alignment with, with those policies. I, I, I guess my comments would be I would be happy to encourage them to do so. I would be happy to um, request of them to do so. But forcing people out of their cars as a condition on this, which is what we're doing when we're saying this. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the eventuality. Creates some, if, if I could just finish. Thank you. That, that creates um, an issue for me as a form of policy making. Um, I understand incentivizing people and, and trying to work from a proactive point of view, but requiring it is challenging for me. Um, and Alyssa, you can weigh in. My understanding with a transportation demand management plan, what you're doing is providing opportunities for people to take other types of uh, transportation other than the single occupant vehicle. It doesn't require somebody to walk or, or bike or take the bus. It just tries yeah, to provide the opportunity. I appreciate that, and I think those are wonderful things that we should request for them to create. There's a difference between when the city government says we require it in order to do it. And for me, that word choice difference matters quite a lot. So thank you. All right, Alan. 
Yeah, the mayor and I have been working on this with the parents and the neighbors for many months, and actually I gave you a, a heads up on it several times at council that this was coming at you, that we would probably need to take action because that's where I saw this going. Uh, so it's not an, no, a new issue by any means. Um, the concern, of course, is that it's too expensive to provide the parking and 4J would then move the school. Uh, and uh, it's already very small, constrained lot. And um, so the neighbors... And the parents, uh, the parents did a door-to-door uh, a, a -door survey. They went around and walked around and talked to almost, uh, as many people as they could. I think it was over 80 that they did, and they found 90 percent of the people were in the neighborhood were in favor of a 90 plus percent of the people were in favor of, of a waiver. They then they surveyed the parents, and and the, and they were also in that 90 plus percent. And the neighborhood association uh, supported it, and then the faculty also 90 plus percent. So. Got everybody kind of in agreement that this is okay, and this way it's been working for a long time. It's a very historic school. It's been there a very long time. In fact, there is a letter in the hallway from Thomas Edison. It's not the letter. It's a copy of the letter. But it, there's a letter on the wall that says, thank you, I'm very honored that, that you named the school after me, uh, which is very kind of cool from the 20s. Uh, and so this is a very unique circumstance to me. It's an old school. It's a neighborhood school. Uh, it needs to be rebuilt. Hopefully they'll save the facade of it and keep the old character of it. Um, but I think this motion that we're looking at is very consistent with what our policies are with regard to 20-minute neighborhoods and alternative modes of transportation with the climate recovery ordinance and neighborhood protections that we've been doing. So I'm, I'm very much supportive of it. With regard to the transportation demand management program, uh, what exactly would they have to do in order to do it? At, in addition to what they're already doing. They're not already doing a TDM, but they're already doing a whole bunch of stuff. Right, and I think some of that stuff could actually be incorporated into this. We thought, it, I, you know, just some things that we talked about off the top of our heads was making sure that they're doing the safe routes to school planning, um, participating in the, you know, there's the commute challenge. So a lot of it would be, in, you know, education, promotion, incentivizing, I think would be the bulk of it. It would also be able to give us a chance to, um, like I said, that that parking agreement we have, that could become, that could be folded into part of the TDM. And it may be that they want to propose adding more bicycle parking for the new school as well. I mean, so there are, that's, I mean, the beauty of the TDMs is it's really site specific. I don't think they're going to be giving out LTD bus passes because that doesn't really make sense here like you know the U of O does but there are other things that they can do but I really think in this case it would really be around the education promotion and incentive. There's a requirement to do the plan and that they and is there a requirement that they implement the plan and achieve any results? Or is it just Typically with the plans they they report the following year what they've done and how that's working. And what if they just didn't do anything? That would be a problem. <laughs> That's what I just asked. Yeah, I, you know, I. This one of the reasons why the language in this isn't very specific is that I think we need some time to to figure out what that code language would look like before we bring that back to you. Um, one of the other uses that has a TDM agreement in the land use code that says you can have a reduction in parking says if you don't have the TDM agreement, then you have to meet regular parking standards. Yeah. So that might be what, you know, the issue would be. And, and, and talking to folks, I, I, they already do almost everything right. they, they require exactly. them to do. So they're basically doing it, not very high hurdle for them. And I don't think there's anything in that TDM, but I don't know exactly what it looks like yet. You know, do you guys, uh, 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 well, that would prevent them from, from this, yeah. from not complying with this. So I think my overall concern was um, whether or not this is unique enough so that the next time it comes up, we don't have, oh, Edison did that. This is a very unique circumstance. Old school, being rebuilt in a neighborhood on a very constrained lot, and and uh, <clears throat> and having him adding a TDM doesn't really bother me that much. I think they can play with it pretty easily. Um, so I, I'm actually very encouraged by this option, it seems to be give the 4J the most certainty, which is what they need in order to move on to their bond um, discussion that they want to have over the next couple of months, right. starting tomorrow. Right. Uh, Claire, and then Chris. Thanks. Um, so I just have a couple of questions. Um, so this process that's being recommended for us by the city manager, if I was understanding your explanation correctly, there is 
public process yes, as part of this absolutely. process. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then uh, with the transportation demand management program, um, by being formally engaged in that, um, will 4J then have access to resources from the city of Eugene that they wouldn't have had otherwise? I'm going to call up Rob Interfell from our, our public works transportation because I am not the TDM expert. So we haven't had that many employers or developers come forward and do TDM programs, but there's a number around the city because when, if they want to re reduce their parking by a certain amount, or in some cases you wouldn't expect this, but if they want to increase by more than a certain amount, they have to enter into a TDM agreement with the city too. And we, you know, it, it varies, but we're happy to work with them and talk about like what makes the most sense for that particular site. If you remember when the TSP was adopted, one of there were three or four actions that the Planning Commission felt so strongly about that they thought they should be actions and not potential actions. One of them was creating a TDM program along the lines of what we're talking about here tonight that would apply to developers and employers. So when uh, an employer or an organization engages in the TDM, then that comes along with some resources from our staff, some some collaboration, some guidance, some help in actually figuring out what makes sense for that particular entity. Right. Yeah. Looks like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand. I understand that. Um, so, and it seems to me it it would be fair in this circumstance to ask for J if we were to do this land use code amendment to waive this on site parking. It's fair because that's what we ask of others to, to engage in the transportation demand management. So while we might be granting them an exception, we're not granting them an exception from every policy that we have attached to this kind of decision making. All right, thank you. Ms. All right, uh, Chris? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am 100% supportive of solving this immediate issue, and so I will absolutely su support this motion. And I also want to solve problems today that don't create problems in the future. Um, it's, a, it's an issue of consequences. And I don't think 4J wants to solve a problem today to create a problem 20 years from now. And if having some sort of a study or a program or a thoughtful effort to say, what might happen over the next year, two years, five years, 10 years uh, that we can anticipate, plan for, and be prepared for, uh, I think is just part of what good neighbors do within a neighborhood. And I think that 4J wants to be a good neighbor in the neighborhood as much as anyone else does. And so I am absolutely supportive of initiating this land use code, but I want to do it with the knowledge that we won't have some unthought of or unanticipated uh, transportation problem in 10 years that nobody bothered to think about because we were so busy just focusing on today's problem. Um, and I don't think I really want to use the word problem because I think it's being more proactive in terms of ensuring we don't have problems later on. Um, there's only so many streets, there's only so much area, there's only so much you can do, and so the more thoughtful and deliberate we are about it, the more we can do it effectively both for 4J and for us. So I don't, I don't see this as a hindrance to them as much as I see it as a way to get them what they need today and also work to, to ensure that there are not problems later on. And I think that 4J and the city can work well enough together um, to come up with a solution that is not only equitable for 4J, but is also equitable for the neighborhood, which is, I think, equally important. So I'm supportive of it, but I'm supportive of it as, as written. Great. Great. Betty? Thank you. I think it's such a good idea that I didn't think we needed to discuss it, I think. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious that's the right thing to do and I've, on that, in that location especially. We don't need more concrete and I will be voting for the motion. Thank you. Mike, do you need a second round? Well, I, I just wanted to say that, yes, I do. Uh, I just want to say Claire and others aren't wrong. Um, that uh, I, I agree entirely with the rationale of what you're saying about what we ought to do and what's wise planning and what what we would hope that good neighbors would do. <clears throat> My concern is we've had a lot of discussions around issues regarding transportation and climate recovery in our ordinance and all of the things that we have talked about for a very long time have been around incentivizing 
and about the manner in which we are going to implement these things rather than forcing people to do things. And my concern is, as was just mentioned, once we start down the road of, well, but we're going to require you to behave in X way in order to get at the thing that you want, we're beginning to uh, try to accomplish goals that we set aspirationally in, in regard to climate recovery in ways that are uh, a different tact than we have taken to this point. And that concerns me because I would like to see us working towards a positive goal rather than working punitively to force people into things. And I'd be, I, I suppose in this case, I will be more than happy to, to make an amendment to the word request rather than require, because I, I absolutely believe we should be asking them to do that. But it's a different thing for me to say, we're going to require it or else. So. Yes, do you want to add? Just a slight clarification on when I was mentioning that, that 4J has two options, either the variance or the adjustment. If they went through the adjustment review process and we granted them a 50% reduction, that goes hand in hand with a TDM program. They actually would be required to do a TDM if they went through that process. Or if they wanted to have 80 parking spaces or, you know, something above and beyond what their maximum number was. So, just for clarity. Ellen? Yeah, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that this does just slightly increase the size of the school in terms of students, so uh, and, and maybe some faculty. So it's, it does add, it does add a little bit, but it's been working well in the neighborhood for 90 years. Uh, I think we don't want to stand in the way of something that actually works well. Like, Rob, uh, the the or or else part of Mike's statement, uh, I'd like you to clarify. So if you had a TDM has is a plan says and you're trying to create create alternative modes of transportation incentivize people to do walking biking and take uh, other modes awesome. of transportation and uh, are there targets in there and then what happens if what's the consequences of not meeting the targets if there are targets how does that so our tdm program right now is pretty for lack of a better word anemic it's just not very well developed and so that's part of the charge in the tsp is to develop a more comprehensive TDM program. So this would be an opportunity to start heading in that direction. I think, you know, it's interesting because a school, you know, they don't have maybe as many resources as an employer in terms of like human resources staff in the school and that sort of thing. So I, th I think we'd want to be really sensitive to how do we make work with the school and the principal to make this something really easy for them to do every year. Like Alyssa said, you know, participate in the business commute challenge for your employees, work with the school district to be part of the Safe Routes to School program. Some of the basic things are that are around encouragement and you know and and this is really just the school would have to participate no one would have to do anything other than driving but the idea is the school would be required to participate in in these programs or whatever they whatever their tdm however their tdm plan is developed right not saying that they wouldn't but what would be the consequences if they didn't i mean i guess it could lead to the parking requirement that Alyssa re referenced earlier we, we've never gone down that road with an with a, an a, uh, employer or a developer before because we don't have that much experience with this um, and finally, uh, you kind of went in somewhere, Mr. Segway, on my question about when we treat a private enterprise that's for profit or even a nonprofit compared to a school, which is a public agency, um, do we, do we treat, I think we should treat them differently in this regard. And, but we don't have that much experience in that. I, mean, I, I would say we partner with the Safe Routes to School program at 4J, so we, you know, we're, we're very invested in each other's programs. So I, you know, I can't imagine that this wouldn't be something that we'd be able to work with them on. Any other? Any? <laughs> right, just one, one more thing yes, is like the please. one difference here is this would apply to employees too, and that's not something that we work with the school district on right now. So it would go beyond just encouragement activities oriented to student how students get to school but employees volunteers other people that are that are you know coming to the school over the course of the day I guess one, one point I had a couple of seconds left is that um, that the precedence of this sets that we I don't think we want to blow up is that we, we require other entities that are looking for the similar thing to go through these same steps and um, I don't think we want to set a precedence that says if you want to do that, you have to do the TDM, but they say, well, 4J didn't have to do it, and, and, uh, and 
we want to say, well, yes, they did. I also just, I, I think we're probably been around, but I just wanted to say one other thing, which is that in so many ways, this school and this part of the school community does exactly what we want to do as a community. And they are willing participants with the potential to create a kind of pilot project for us in terms of how the TDM rolls out, that this is a particularly strong opportunity for us to sort of learn where some of the challenges are in doing this for other agencies. So it seems like we have been presented with a kind of a wonderful opportunity to learn a little bit more with a, with a part of the community that really wants to do that work and is, uh, is supportive of it. So it seems, seems great to me. And are we ready to put a motion on the table? And Alan, did you want the opportunity to do that, or? I'd be happy to allow Alan that. He's <laughs> worked on this, but I, I will ask him to consider that if we request, we're all happy to work together and we're getting what we want rather than requiring. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, a little worried about that precedent, so you can make that as a, for, an amendment. Yeah, um, I won't waste I move to initiate land use code amendment to waive on-site parking requirements for a new or remodeled school at the Edison Elementary School site and require 4J School District to enter into a transportation demand management program agreement with the City of Eugene. Second. Any further discussion? Yes. I'm not going to waste everybody's time with an amendment that will fail, but I, I think we're actually setting the exact wrong precedent with the one you're concerned about. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Ready for a vote? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's great. None opposed. Thank you very much. And that passes. That's great. Thank you for that. Walking us through that. And now we're ready for a changing of the guard. And our Jeff next will come up and uh, lead us in this next discussion. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jeff Petrie. I manage parking and technology for the city of Eugene. And I'm here to talk to you about Hatton Avenue. So one of the services that the city of Eugene's parking program provides all over the city of Eugene is uh, part of our neighborhood strengthening program, which is one officer that responds to complaints across the entire city of Eugene. And usually those complaints are blocked driveways, uh, wrong way parking, um, storage on the street, we remove junk from the street, burned out trailers. Uh, one of the things we encounter as we go through our job is a patchwork of jurisdiction. So there are certain parts of town that our parking officer is in the office pulling up a GIS map like this and trying to figure out if the address of the reported issue is on city property or county property. And then once we go out to the location, we sometimes bring a wheel and try to wheel out the GIS locations to try to figure out whose jurisdiction we're on. And so this is a, a great example of the yellow, which is the property that's been annexed in the city of Eugene. Uh, there's some street jurisdictions here. Lane County is in green. Uh, Lane County local access road is white. It's down by Rosetta Park. And then the City of Eugene annexation in this area. So the Echo Apartments, which is on the upper right-hand side there at Hatton Avenue, uh, were built a couple years ago, 2015. And we had some f uh, spillover parking from that from this location into the Evergreen Hatton Avenue interchange, which is just to the uh, west of the apartment complex. So we have been engaged with uh, the area residents and the Echo Apartments, working with management, talking to the property owners. Uh, we, we, I spoke on Friday with the current property owner in San Francisco, uh, trying to solve this problem so, uh, so we don't have to come here tonight. However, as we work through here, I'll focus on this area here. Uh, on the right side where you see the sidewalks is the City of Eugene Street, and on the left side is the Lane County property. This is Hatton Avenue with uh, Evergreen on the far left. So some of the parking behaviors that we would see here, uh, the, uh, this is the intersection there on Hatton Avenue looking west with the cross section of Evergreen in the top picture. And some of the things that we are called upon to enforce is uh, parking within 50 feet of a stop sign, which this is a county road, so we would not enforce that. 
a parking away from the curb it's pretty far away here and then uh, code enforcement deals with the or helps the trash cans that are left out and you'll see the trash cans have been left out for several years here to mitigate some of the parking behavior at the bottom is looking back towards Echo, towards River Road, and uh, there's the same trash cans. These are actually uh, two years apart, the photos. And the uh, there's a truck uh, sitting next to a camper that would be double parking in the right of way, uh, which would be self-reinforced. There's a camper on the right side that uh, it's questionable. It is actually in the, in the Lane County right of way. Uh, and then on the bottom right is a wrong way parking vehicle. So I was out here this morning at 9 a.m. and just looking around. Last November, Greg Rickoff, Lane County, and myself, we went out, uh, had a parking conversation uh, with neighbors at Kelly Middle School, and I would say 75 or more attendees at the uh, uh, conversation. We listened, and we heard a lot of ideas around uh, how to do the parking enforcement, how to work with Echo Apartments, how to uh, try to change the behavior in this area uh, so everyone can live together in this, in this uh, around the Echo Apartments. Some of the ideas that came out were uh, asking the city to annex the county roads. And the reason why those ideas came out was that we have been using this area as a, as a kind of a path or exploration of seeing if we could enter into an intergovernment agreement of Lane County where the city parking program could go in force on the county roads and try to clean up the uh, enforcement right now. So if it... <coughs> If we get a complaint, it's not on city jurisdiction. We hand it over to the county waymaster, and the county waymaster may or may not be able to respond. We're trying to uh, respond to the resident's concern here by not having to bounce back and forth between two jurisdictions. Uh, as we did the exploration of entering into an IGA where the city could enforce on the county roads, uh, our charter doesn't allow us to do that. So we looked at uh, the, having the county adopt essentially the city's parking code so that a city's parking officer could go enforce on the county roads and cite in a circuit court. And then it just got complicated. <laughs> and so we, we, we were trying to find a good way to solve the problem and it got complicated. So uh, we're here tonight. Uh, the question at the work session was to annex Hatton Road, which is on the left side with the purple dots, and it extends to the west to Parnell. And on the right is a larger area of annexation that would, uh, only the streets, that would uh, kind of connect all the dots between the city and the county, and also include a local access road at the bottom there next to Rosetta Park and New City Park where we receive a ton of complaints. I shouldn't say a ton of complaints. We receive regular complaints in this area and we're not able to respond to the complaints uh, because it's a county road. So options to consider, uh, annex Hatton Avenue from River Road to Parnell Drive, uh, annex a larger street system around Hatton Avenue, or do not initiate annexation at this time. I'm here for questions. All right, that's great. Thank you very much for that explanation. I have Mike and then Betty in the queue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have for many years, since at least 08, and maybe sooner, maybe before that, at least 10 years, had a council, um, if not policy and understanding, that we were not likely to annex roads in River Road in Santa Clara unless they were immediately adjacent to a property that was voluntarily uh, asking to annex into the city. Um, we have also had, uh, I have asked many, many, many times the point of absurdity really to please have a, a plan of action for the roads that we already have that are not at uh, city standard to bring those unimproved roads up to city standards or some sort of comprehensive plan around that. And I know we've talked about that um, and, and hopefully we still have that as an opportunity coming. Um, but I've said in the interim, I, I generally speaking would probably not want to be in favor of annexing in more streets that are not at a city standard without a plan for what do we do about that? Do you, do you want to comment on that at all, Jeff? <laughs> I'm not the uh, city engineer, but I can comment on a, 
there's two different types of annexation. Uh, a local access road, which is the white segment down by Rosetta, that would come directly into the city's jurisdiction, uh, exactly what you're speaking to. Uh, the county roads is a two-step process, so it's possible to annex the road, but the county still owns and maintains the underlying gravel pavement. So, uh, so I think what we're proposing here is an annexation, which is a layer that will go over the road, but the county still owns the road and maintains it. <laughs> so we'll complicate this process and question a little further, it seems, maybe, in that. Um, I'm ambivalent on this question still. I'll listen to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Can I just jump in for a second? And the layer is a layer that just allows us to <clears throat> enforce parking. I believe that's correct, but I'm looking at, at Catherine. I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, the Right now, part of the it got complicated issue was the way um, we obviously cannot cite people into our municipal court if it occurs outside city limits. So right now, we wouldn't be able to cite somebody um, for violating, even if the, the even if the county wanted to allow us to do it, we wouldn't have the authority under our charter to cite somebody for violating a city parking code requirement into our municipal court. Um, similarly, we wouldn't be able to cite somebody for violating in a county parking requirement into our municipal court, which is where our infrastructure for parking enforcement lives. I mean, that's so we they need to be connected. So what annexing would do is be that first step into being able to enforce city code on these streets. Now, we think likely what would need to, there would probably be, need to be a second step, which would be some sort of intergovernmental agreement because the county would be maintaining its jurisdiction over these roads. They'd be annexed into the city, but there would probably be an IGA where the county and the city come to agreement where the county and the city say, yes, city, please enforce um, code, please enforce parking out here and do that. And so there would be, this is, annexing's the necessary first step, probably not the last step, um, likely the first and only step for the council to, to need to take, but to actually start the enforcement process, we anticipate, because <clears throat> right-of-way jurisdiction and enforcement is just complicated. It just has a lot of different steps. But what we do know is that without it being annexed, we can't um, we can't go down the road. Sorry for the fun. We can't go down the path of, yeah, yeah, <laughs> of being able to I don't do want to go down that road. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Betty? Um, I'm more confused than I was. Oops. I I was concerned, I'm always concerned about annexing county roads that aren't up to standards, and then we end up asking people to pay to improve those roads. Um, and I take it that we're not really doing that. We, it, what you would be doing was initiating the process to annex them, but we wouldn't be taking ownership of them. So they, right now, within city limits, and I see our city engineer here too, so I might call on his expertise, but right now within city limits, there are roads under county jurisdiction. Just like within city limits, there's roads under the state's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so what this would be doing, except for the small, the portion that was a local access road, um, so for Hatton Street, for example, that would, if it was ultimately annexed, if you chose to ultimately annex, it would still be under the ownership and jurisdiction of the county. It would simply be within city limits. So we would not have responsibility to improve the road. Correct. We wouldn't be asking... We wouldn't be asking the people to pay to improve the roads. <laughs> I was really concerned about that. And, but we could... We could annex the roads without an annexing the abutting houses. Correct. Yep. It seems very strange. Do you think people would understand that? That they. We, we've done it. I mean, River. Most recently, um, the council initiated and annexed a portion of River Road yeah. um, that we wanted, and we, there are some properties that um, about that, as I understand, that are not annexed. Is that? Actually? Yeah. Is that? Is actually on the map. Oh, you got a slide. <clears throat> um, so there's a hashed area on the right side, River Road. Uh, we have, 
Is there one on there? I need a John first. Yeah, right now. <laughs> Oh, right here. River Road. And up here. Mm -hmm. So we, we have done this recently where we've annexed uh, pieces of River Road uh, to make it continuous for the city uh, city annexation. And there are abutting county properties. The properties did not come in. But do we own the, the road? Do, or does the county still own the bottom part of the roadway on the top? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't. I don't know the answer. I don't know if Mark does. I don't know the. I don't know if we because there's there's kind of two separate things. There's annexation of a road with, to, within the city limits, and then there's the jurisdictional transfer, and those are distinct. And I think what you're hearing about the discussion tonight is it's the annexation piece, not the jurisdictional transfer piece, and it doesn't become our responsibility to maintain or improve or all those things unless there's the jurisdictional. Transfer. What if someday the adjoining properties do annex, then would that make a difference? Then would the road be, would we be responsible for the road? No. No? Okay. I, um, that, that's correct. So, so that particular section of River Road, we went through that annexation process so that we could, that was part of responding to the neighborhood and the desire to have lower speeds and have mm -hmm. one enforcement jurisdiction so that you weren't going from the city to the county and back to the city again and uh, so we annexed the roadway so that um, Eugene police could have a um, there wouldn't be a question about who the road the enforcement responsibility was in that section of the road with regard to speeding thank you okay so, uh, Claire thank you um, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for, I know you've done a lot of work on this. Um, and I just want to kind of emphasize that this work session is uh, the culmination, I think, of at least two years of effort on behalf of the immediate neighbors near Echo Apartments, John Belcher the, um, with the River Road uh, Community Organization, and Commissioner Pat Farr um, advocating for his constituents to bring this option to a place for us to even consider this, which uh, I think is a very creative solution to a complicated problem. Um, so just, I guess the analogy, another analogy would be, uh, we, have a we have a state highway, what, Highway 99 runs through the city and we're allowed to give traffic tickets on Highway 99 because it's in the city. Is that correct? Yes. I... So this would do the same thing. So we don't own Highway 99, but we have jurisdiction over it because it's in the city limits. I'll look to Mark <laughs> on the ownership piece. Yeah, well, that's that's correct. I mean, it's really, it's the enforcement. This is an analogy. Yes, that's exactly right. It's so, the enforcement authority. So we'd be doing the same thing yeah. with these streets. And I would support option B um, because the problem we're trying to solve is people from the apartments who must pay for their parking spots, which is uh, something I won't, well, is that not correct? Can I jump in? Go right ahead. Uh, so I did speak to ownership uh, on Friday, had a good conversation with Trevor. The, they have 192 units, they have 239 spaces, they have 192 free spaces that come with each unit. There are some, if you want to bring more cars, they do have a uh, $50 a month charge for like 20, 25 extra spaces. All right, extra. That was part of our learning process through this. All right, well good, I'm glad to hear at least for the base unit, uh, a parking space comes with that, because I thought that was definitely contributing if they have to charge for any space at the apartment complex. But um, I also wondered if this would, I don't know that this has been a big problem in these streets, but would this jurisdictional transfer allow us to enforce things like our camping ban for people who are living in vehicles on public streets? We don't, uh, my my program doesn't enforce the camping ban. I guess um, we, you know, usually we. But I think it. Yeah. For our, for on the on the street, it mm -hmm. would yeah. yes. Yeah. So where we get complaints and we send St. Vincent to Paul to knock on the mm -hmm. door and try to have a conversation and see if they can move into a car camping site. Um, so all right, well you've answered my questions. Um, I I think this. Uh, because it does not have us taking responsibility for the actual physical streetscape, but it does allow us to mitigate the impacts of 
a city, you know, a, a city supported uh, in terms of policy development that increased um, parking activity in that neighborhood, I um, appreciate the thinking about the larger option B because if they can't park on Hatton, folks are just going to go two blocks further and park on those nearby streets as well. And so we would just be moving the problem to another set of streets. Um, I think what staff has uh, proposed helps kind of capture that dynamic and um, I think is a much more proactive way to mitigate the problem that we're trying to solve here. Okay, Chris. Yeah, just for clarity, the problem is bad parking. And the people in the neighborhood are upset about bad parking. And the county doesn't have the resources to deal with the bad parking. Um, and so if they were to allow the city of Eugene to have authority over these streets, we could do something about the bad parking. That's the problem, that's the solution. Unintended consequences would be, we take over authority of these streets and now we suddenly are responsible for repairing them, fixing them and maintaining them. That would not be the case. So that would not be an unintended consequence. We simply are being granted the authority to fix the parking problem. With that in mind, option A only fixes the problem on one street. Option B allows us to deal with the problem on a number of streets. And my sense is the neighbors would prefer us to be able to fix their parking problem on a number of streets rather than just one street. Is that the impression you have from talking with folks? Yeah, that was from the uh, talking with the neighborhood, talking with the community meeting. Uh, absolutely, that's what the sentiment was. I think the other important thing on the enforcement pieces in this area or all over the city of Eugene is a complaint only. So we're not circulating in the area as part of a beat. Um, we really are getting a phone call, an email, a request for service, a transfer from uh, EPD to go out and uh, uh, deal or manage a complaint. So it, uh, what we worked with the neighborhoods is that uh, they have a current problem. If it was in the city, if we had the ability to enforce, we would go out for a week or two. Uh, provide enforcement services, and then we back away until we start getting complaints again. Okay. So it allows us to kind of step in and back off, step in and back off. But it would give a neighbor greater certainty that if they lodge a complaint, something will happen. Correct. Uh, this seems like a duh to me, that option B, where we can provide a greater benefit to more neighbors without incurring the consequence of having to pay for streets at this point, uh, seems like a, a logical move. I mean, uh, I wanna help the neighbors and if this is a way to help them, uh, I'm all for it. Okay, Greg? So I've got, I've got two questions on this. First of all, um, if, we are, if, if we are ultimately going to be collecting, you know, parking fees as well as uh, possible traffic fines in the area. Do we retain those fees and fines or do we have to give that money over to the county? Uh, so from the parking side, it's a citation, parking fine. And yeah. so that comes back into the par city of Eugene's parking enterprise fund. So we retain that, uh, the traffic, I, I'm not sure about that piece. And we can certainly, I mean, I would suspect that would be part of the, an I, the IGA that we work out if we're doing parking enforcement out there. Um, those are the kind of issues that we can we can address in that. If there's an if there if it turns out there's a lack of clarity that they would come, um, I don't see why we couldn't resolve that. My my thing would be you know if if we're if we're doing parking enforcement, then it goes from my logic takes me to, you know you can also write tickets for people who are, um, you know doing things illegally while the car is in motion. Um, and therefore, ergo, with that MOU or MOA or whatever we we craft in this, that we would be able to retain um, those, those those fines, the revenue from those fines as well. Yes, our intent would be is if we're expending the resources to do the enforcement, then any resources that result from that enforcement would come back to the city organization. I, I just want to make sure that that's clear. And then the other thing that I think may um, cause people some confusion and maybe some consternation is if they see more city of Eugene police vehicles out there and writing those 
tickets, will they assume that the city will also be covering those county, you know, properties, you know, in terms of law enforcement that, um, you know, are there? Because people make the assumption, oh, now we've got full city um, police services mm -hmm. when they don't. I'm a support option B, but I just want to kind of get a sense of, you know, how we make sure we communicate that distinction to neighbors who may be residing in the county. And then all of a sudden they're seeing us writing tickets on their street and then think, well, we're also supposed to, you know, take care, take care of other issues of you know, domestic violence or whatever happens. I, I think that's an excellent point. And so I do think we'll need to be really thoughtful on how we ensure people's expectations are, are uh, authentic and, and, and truly understand who's going to respond in what situation. You know, whether yes. it's the state police or, you know, the county sheriff's office or whoever. Because we won't. Uh, to your point, uh, the police will not be responding onto the property, for right. example. Exactly. And so uh, we will want to make that very clear. Alan. In, in my area, police don't hand out parking tickets. It's the parking enforcement people, which are the meter maids. And they're in the little three-wheeled vehicles that run around. So really different look, feel. It would be hard to... I think confuse those with with the police department with the police truck police vehicles so the problem is parking violations and impacting the neighborhood livability and uh, and all the uh, things that go along with people parking in front of your driveway and all those other kinds of things the solution is the enforcement and a parking program and then uh, and, and the reason we're doing this is because the city already has all that and the county doesn't have that so they'd have to re create all that got it so far uh yes i think so <clears throat> and uh and the least onerous way to get there is this annexation of a county road and that allows the city to do the enforcement and the implementation of the parking program but not take responsibility for the street maintenance and so i the area i represent around the university we have numerous uh parking programs and, and understand fully the impact that um, bad parking behavior has on livability. It's a big pain for a lot of people, and uh, and 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 the parking districts work uh, well, and they're and and, uh, and and they're well done. And Jeff's um, department does a great job. Um, so the next steps, if we had, so if we did this and we went through this annexation, the next steps for the parking program would they would the neighborhood have to initiate that and 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 then have it go into this, say, option B area, and then could other streets uh, that are orange, that are city jurisdiction, could they opt in? So there, there's a couple steps before we even get to that step. Okay, so what I've heard from the neighborhood is not to do a residential permit program. They just want us to come solve some problems. Uh, so I don't that's that would be a conversation we would have with any neighborhood across the city right now uh, So that they could if they chose to if that's the, the path correct uh, Before we get there there are a few today tonight is a first step. There is several steps including a, 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 pro, a public process uh, Before we can get to the annexation so there, there's several other steps that we need to take before we so can get I, to that I point. agree that if you can handle the problem with enforcement don't necessarily go to a parking permit process in a parking district that that works much better and so they may end up coming back to us and asking us to do this but, uh, and they would have to initiate that that's correct yeah we don't and we don't impose parking districts we initiate at the request of the majority of the neighbors I was the only person that voted no on my block but um, now I would have voted yes <laughs> it actually works very well Okay, I have Mike and Claire for second round. Thank, Thank you, you Mayor. Jeff, I didn't see what would be the cost of us providing this service. You know, so the city parking program, it, uh, we have one officer who circulates every day responding to these complaints, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> less than 10,000. But we're giving that to residents who aren't residents of the city, right? Don't we, pay city taxes. 
No, uh, if I, I, I don't know that. This map, I see one yellow property on the corner of that street and three up above. So everything north of the apartment complex, if I read this map right, are non-city residents. Is that correct? Yes. So all those streets that we're bringing in there that we'll be providing this service for are all fronted with non-city resident properties. Is that correct? The ones that aren't yellow. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, so here's the thing. I, I, Greg brought up w what was for me the the bigger point here, and I'll, I'll ex that we're providing that city service to non-city residents. I will say a couple of things. Number one, um, I asked for and we had a work session on voluntary annexation of those neighborhoods and encouraging them to do so f over four years ago now. And the end of that work session was we're going to create a program. We had an agreement on what those kind of conditions would be where we might offer to the residents, hey, annex into the city. It'll, it'll you know, for all the conditions we've discussed. It is way past time for us to do that because these kind of conflicts and interface issues aren't going away. And we cannot force people, in my opinion, to annex that don't want to. But we certainly have an opportunity to make it an attractive option for those neighbors and thereby creating and solving a number of these problems. If you look at this issue that Greg and I are talking about from the inverse, it's what if there is a part of the city parking code that these neighbors don't want? That suddenly you're going to now enforce something that they didn't know was part of the city parking code and now suddenly a bunch of neighbors think, well, wait a minute, I don't want you to do that. None of them can vote for their city councilor. So, sorry, you're just going to have to live with it now. And there's nothing they can do about it. They don't have a voice at the council table. It, I think that our focus should be to do this the right way rather than the short circuit way. I'll probably vote to support this particular thing because it's a very small area. It's to solve a specific problem for a lot of people, and there are a lot of folks who've worked on this. But it's the wrong way for us to be doing business with this, in my opinion. We should go back to having the conversation around voluntary annexation and our effort to invite everybody to join the community because it's the right thing to do and we'll have fewer of these problems in the long run for doing it. And we'll, the city will have greater revenue to be able to offer greater services to people. Thank you. Okay. Claire. Thanks. Just a couple of things. So um, I do appreciate the raising of the concern that if we start parking enforcement on the streets that folks might assume that means, oh, somehow I'm going to get police services here too. So I think it would be important for us to communicate um, with residents about this change. And I do think that the River Road Community Organization is in a very good position and would be willing to help with that outreach and, and clear communication. And then just as Alan said, um, EPD officers don't drive around in their uh, vehicles giving out parking tickets. It's the city of Eugene vehicle. And, and away from the university, they actually drive an actual car um, uh, that says, I think, e-park on the side of it. So uh, no one would confuse that with the police officer. Um, it'd be unlikely. So, and, and then in terms of uh, parking codes that they may not like, one of the things is they will be required to pull their trash cans out of the right of way now, um, but they were putting them in the right of way to try and discourage people from the apartments parking in front of their house. So it might, you know, hopefully it, this, um, I, I appreciate uh, my colleagues' uh, support for this. Um, I do think it is, it does have broader implications, um, kind of like our Edison parking discussion uh, might. I think it's trying to solve a problem that we, the city of Eugene, helped create. Um, not the patchwork problem, but the locating of a large multifamily um, development, which, which was important to have, but had these unintended consequences on the neighborhood that we were not able to solve other than uh, looking at a, a a solution of this kind so thank you Great. okay everybody had a chance Greg you want one more yeah just 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 one more I want to point out something again I understand that that you know you're gonna have like a car will be out there responding on a 
complaint-driven basis. <laughs> but, you know, if you're having, um, I'll give you an example. This happened not too long ago on my street. Um, you know, somebody decides to have a big party. Everybody's parking illegally. They're calling, you know, at 1 o'clock in the morning. You know, your parking officer isn't going to just be the one that goes out there and responds to that. And or you have a situation where you've got some traffic issues that are going on and where people are blowing through a street. They're blowing through Benjamin at 40 miles an hour. Then we're going to be asked to, you know, provide traffic enforcement service along with um, parking service, correct? We could. Yep. We could. Yeah. It's so it's entirely possible that that could that could be the the case. I just want to point that out because you know people will get confused if they see uh, you know uh, Eugene Cruiser out there and you know um, are expecting a higher level of service than what we are um, statutorily uh, required to provide under this agreement. So, just, just say it. Okay. Yes, you ready to put the motion on the table? I will. I move to direct the city manager to begin <clears throat> the annexation process for streets included in option B and bring back for council approval. Second. Any further comments? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. None opposed. <laughs> it passes. That's great. Thank you very, thank, thank you. you very much for walking us through that. And. Now, I'm adjourning the meeting of the City Council and opening a work session uh, of the Eugene Urban Renewal Agency. All right, Mayor, I'll turn it over to Amanda to take us through this conversation. Good evening. My name is Amanda Noble Flannery, and I'm the Economic Prosperity Programs Manager. I do have a short presentation with some slides. Um, you may recall on December 13th, you received an update on the downtown riverfront property project from Denny Bro and Sarah Maderi, at which time Denny referenced that a portion of the downtown riverfront property that we're working to purchase from eWeb is outside of the riverfront urban renewal district. And today's work session is about that topic. <coughs> this is the downtown riverfront property outlined in hot pink. In green is where the riverfront park will be. For some additional orientation, the steam plant is at the southern end. Alton Baker Park is across the river. And Sarah is joining us on the river in a boat. <laughs> Today's discussion will focus on the properties north of 4th Avenue. Before we get into the boundary expansion proposed today, let's recap the agency board related milestones. In January and July of 2016, the agency board approved the deal points for entering into a purchase and sale agreement with EWEB for the property. In December of 2016, the agency board approved supplemental budget number one, which included urban renewal funds to purchase the downtown riverfront property. We then executed the purchase and sale agreement with EWEB and started the due diligence period. During this time, it became clear that a small portion of the property is outside of the district. In December of 2000, this last December, the River Guides reviewed the boundary expansion and recommended approval. I'll say more about the River Guides in a minute. And today we'll discuss the boundary expansion, which is a necessary step before we purchase the property. Which brings us to our discussion today. Here's the downtown riverfront property again. And if we add the riverfront urban renewal district here in purple, you can see the relationship between the property and the urban renewal district. As you can see, the properties north of 4th Avenue are just outside of the district boundary. And we've always intended to purchase these properties. But in order to use urban renewal funds to pay for them, the district boundary would need to be expanded to include those properties. The proposed expansion to do this is shown in yellow. It's 1.1 acres. This proposed expansion can be approved with the agency board resolution in your packet, attachment C. The expansion is within state statute requirements and does not impact the terms of the deal with eWeb nor the purchase price of the property. 
The advisory committee for the Riverfront Urban Renewal District is the River Guides, and the agency board selected them last October. They met on December 12th to discuss the proposed expansion and unanimously recommended approving the boundary expansion. You may be wondering about the parcel labeled mill lot on the screen outlined in pink. It's also owned by eWeb, but it's not part of the proposed expansion. Under the terms of the purchase and sale agreement, the agency has a right of first refusal on the property. Um, it's a service parking lot that serves the eWeb headquarters building. And the right of first refusal provides under what future circumstances the agency would have the opportunity to purchase it. Since we won't be buying it at this time, the mill lot was not included in the proposed expansion. Before we talk about the agency board's options for tonight, I'll review the next steps for the downtown project, riverfront project. After the agency board decides whether or not to expand the district boundary, staff will conclude the final pre-closing steps for the property purchase with an anticipated closing date at the end of the month. City Council is tentatively scheduled to discuss funding options for the seven railroad crossings not near the Riverfront Urban Renewal District on February 26th. Later that evening, the agency board will consider a district boundary expansion to include the High and Pearl Street crossings within the district for use of urban renewal funds for the quiet zone improvement work. And if the purchase of the mill lot is proceeding, the agency board could consider a boundary expansion resolution to add it to the district at that time. Today, the agency board can take one of the following actions, approve the proposed expansion, decline the proposed expansion and identify other funds to purchase the property north of 4th Avenue, or decline the proposed expansion and direct the agency director to discuss with eWeb removing those properties from the purchase. We're available for questions. Thank you very much. So do I have counselors with questions? Betty? Alan? Okay. <clears throat> I don't know whether it's a question. I have comments. The urban renewal agencies, in most cases, have an have ending date. Ours don't seem to. Ours, ours, is, ours are immortal. And they're not only immortal, but they can grow. And I don't think we should let this one grow anymore. It's uh, urban renewal is a diversion of funds. Uh, that's one re one objection I have to it. Diverts funds from other possible uses, such as park improvements, for example. And it is too easy to spend the money without public participation. And I will be voting against any expansion to urban renewal district. Okay, Alan. Um. Well, I'm not very supportive of urban renewal di districts in general. This is more or less a technical fix to uh, an inadvertent uh, overlooking of the of what the boundaries <coughs> were and what the property were, and making those two things uh, be consistent is what this is all about. Because we ended up going into an agreement, <coughs> all of the EUL properties we thought it was in the riverfront. But it wasn't, and so now, um, because we will take ownership of those, and or and eventually potentially a developer, they need to, they should be in the in the the district, the urban real district, but, right? Basically, um, and so question about the mill lot. Why wasn't that included in the original deal? Why does it have a first of right, first right of, right of first control. refusal? EWEB uses those lots to, for the headquarters building, and they want to keep them together for that sale. Don't they use the other lot? Aren't those parking lots? Yes. So they, the well, mill law was not, they didn't declare that surplus as part of their original deal, or did they? I would have to check. Yeah. The whole area is a parking lot. I was wondering why there was a distinction from EWEB between the mill lot and the other ones? I, I think uh, what I remember the conversations over the last couple of years is that uh, the mill lot they anticipate uh, potentially still using for their use, and the other two lots they surplused and therefore uh, didn't anticipate a particular use. So, and In this case, <clears throat> this map's a little odd in that it 
has this little segment of the street that goes up and then incorporates the two lots to the left. Uh, why didn't we just incorporate all of 4th Avenue into the urban rural district and make it a, just a contiguous? Yeah, or deer. Um, the reason we didn't include 4th Avenue is to reserve the amount of the district can be expanded. The state statute caps it at 20% of the original district acreage. With this expansion, the district will have a, be expanded by 17.1%. Oh, and with the street, it was to go over 20 or come close? No, but it's just for future expansions if, oh, that's if the agency good. board wanted to, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think that urban renewal districts and tax increment financing are fantastic tools when they are used as they're designed. I am not a fan of them in this community because it is my opinion that for years we have used them inappropriately. We've tax increment financing is designed so that the municipality can help somebody borrow against the future increase in value today to build something up and make it worth more money if it's private property so that when the district goes away tomorrow the taxes somebody pays on that will be much more and everybody wins you got a nicer use the public wins from that the municipality wins because the taxes they pay that are paid are bigger. Everybody wins when it is used the way it's designed. We have tended to use urban renewal for public purposes that don't increase the tax base, and thus I don't think it's the right tool in many cases when we do that. And I don't think uh, when they never go away, I think that's also a problem as well. In this case, this seems to be an expansion for the purpose of using this exactly as it was created because as that goes to a part of our riverfront development plan, it can be something developed for private use that will increase the tax base and everybody wins. So I'm in favor of this expansion in this area because it's being used as the tool was designed. Thank you. Hey, Jennifer. Alan asked my question, so I'm good. Okay. Anybody else? Shall I read this okay, thing Okay, please, go for it. <clears throat> I move to adopt the resolution in attachment C <laughs> to the AIS to amend the Riverfront Urban Renewal Plan to expand the boundary by 1.1 acres. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? One. And it passes six to one. Thank you so much. And that closes the Urban Renewal Agency meeting. And I've already closed the council meeting. So we'll see you again in 40, 40 minutes or so.